Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and piratical maid of all work. Out of all the direct antecedents to the modern musical, the work of William S. Gilbert and Arthur Sullivan is perhaps the most famous and enduring. The plots of their operettas poke fun at human foibles in a way that rings as true now as it did in the 19th century, and their catchy patter songs are easily tweaked to suit any purpose. As a result, there are scores of revisions, rewrites, parodies, and other tributes to Gilbert and Sullivan and their works, and inevitably, some of these are pretty bad. Among the most notorious is our next offender, the pirate movie. This Australian misadventure is loosely based on the Pirates of Penzance and strongly based on its producer's desire to cash in on the popular trends of the moment. Pirates was undergoing a surge in popularity in the early 1980s thanks to a successful Broadway revival. So Ted Hamilton and company took the story, replaced most of the classic score with pop tunes, cast two fat actors of the moment in the leads, while Hamilton took the role of the Pirate King for himself. I can't imagine where this went wrong. Shall we find out? Already this movie's got me thinking of the wrong kind of seaman. Let's deal right away with the Eldritch Abomination in the room with sin number one, the additional music. The early 80s easy listening tunes don't fit with the handful of Gilbert and Sullivan songs that remain. A fact that I could easily forgive if the music in question was, you know, any good. But Mike Brady's contributions range from forgettable to unforgettably bad, and are accompanied by the sort of synth and drum kit orchestrations you'd find on a cheap karaoke track. Loved, timeless and true, whenever I need strength I look to you, tonight. You replaced Poor Wandering One with that? We open on a generic seaside town celebrating Pirate Week, which is some sort of historical reenactment, touristy, festival thing. Taking in the sights are a bevy of swimsuit-clad gals and their mousy flunky Mabel, played by Christy McNichol in standard I'm wearing glasses and frumpy clothes so you'll be surprised when I turn out to be a haughty later mode and chief among the sights they are taking in is that of the perpetually shirtless Christopher Atkins as the local swordplay demonstrator. Ladies, anybody want to learn the art of swordsmanship from a master of cut and thrust? Lunge and parry, in and out. What are you captain of? The innuendo squad. Atkins takes a liking to Mabel because of plot and invites her and her friends for a ride on his boat, but the mean girls commandeer the vessel and leave Mabel stranded. So Mabel does what any person with absolutely no nautical experience would do. Rents a boat and heads out into the open sea after them. Of course, she gets into trouble. And look closely, because there's a subtle difference here between the long shots and the close-ups. Incredible, isn't it? It's almost as if McNichol was just sitting in the studio tank getting water thrown in her face. The highly localized storm blows Mabel overboard, and with no life vest or survival skills, she... washes up on a convenient shore that wasn't there two minutes ago. And as she lies unconscious, the screen goes all fuzzy and we're thrust into the actual story through that most absurd of framing devices, the dream sequence. This part of the movie follows the same basic premise as Pirates of Penzance. Atkins plays Frederick, a young lad apprenticed by chance to the pirate King Gah! Sweet Lucifer, Jareth thinks you're calling too much attention to your junk. But Frederick is now 21 years old, his apprenticeship is over, and he has vowed to dedicate himself to law and order and bring his former compatriots to justice. I've been as low and vicious as I could. But something inside tells me there's, there's more to life. What are you, a Disney princess? Mark off sin number two for Atkins' terrible acting, which stands out even among the lousy performances of the rest of the cast. Frederick is also a bit restless, as he's been at sea his entire life and has never seen a woman apart from the ship's nurse and token lady pirate Ruth, 
the pirate codpiece, King, casts Frederick off on his own in a lifeboat, luckily within spyglass distance of a nearby cove and an entire chorus of genteel ladies. <gasps> ah, it's a Freudoscope! And as good an excuse as any to talk about sin number three, the forced attempt at zany humor. Absurdity is a key element in Gilbert and Sullivan's works. It's part of what makes them so much fun. In Pirates of Penzance alone, we have pirates who aren't very good at pirating, a hero with a firm but very ill-thought-out code of honor, a major general whose education has covered everything except anything useful to his job, bumbling policemen, and the world's loudest stealth attack. This is obviously stuff that's not meant to be taken seriously. The pirate movie either doesn't understand the inherent humor of its source material, or more likely doesn't expect the audience to understand it. Instead of letting the absurdity of the whole premise speak for itself, it drowns it under a tide of broad slapstick, crass jokes, and constant winking through the fourth wall. Picture watching your favorite comedy while this guy is sitting next to you. Hey, 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 not a mean, not a mean, that's not say no more. That's what this movie feels like. The frolicking beauties are the daughters of Major General Stanley, and Mabel is the youngest among them. Like her modern counterpart, this Mabel is also an outcast, probably because she dresses like a reject from Xanadu. But Frederick takes a liking to her, and before long they're making easy listening music together. I'm not sure if they're filming a love scene or the commercial for the soundtrack. Sessions presents Songs of the Pirate Movie, featuring that one song, that other song, and that really, really bad song. Like a lot of musical romantic leads, Mabel and Frederick go from, hey, you're kind of cute, to let's get married with astonishing speed. But there are obstacles. Custom dictates Mabel cannot marry until her older sisters do, and anyway an ex-pirate is hardly a suitable match for a major general's daughter, and anyway anyway the rest of the pirates show up to rape and pillage and mostly chase the girls around like a bad Benny Hill sketch. Mabel steps up to defend her family from the pirate king. You see, the blade grows heavy. She cannot raise it to my heart. I'm not aiming at your heart. Well, you shouldn't make it such a prominent target, then. The pirate Batch, King, gets the better of Mabel, but fortunately she is rescued by the arrival of her modern Major General father and the famous modern Major General song, complete with thrown-in topical references. I comprehend contemporary culture, North American, I straighten more piratical erections than Boderic, and I... If I may play Angel's Advocate for a moment, it's true, this does date the movie in a big hurry but it's also common practice. Go to your local summer stock production of Gilbert and Sullivan, and it's better than even odds that there will be one or two jokes about current or local events dropped into the script. Rewrites of the Major General's song in particular are so widespread that more people are probably familiar with the parodies than the actual lyrics. Even I've done one. <clears throat> I am the very model of a diva demoniacal like... <laughs> all right, all right. Yeesh, everyone's a critic. So, all in all, it wouldn't be fair of me to single out this movie for doing something which scores of other productions have done before and since. But what's the fun of being a demon if I can't be evil for the hear of it every now and then? Bad rewrite of the Major General song, sin number four. The Major General already has a beef with the pirates since they stole his family jewels. Not to be confused with the ones that the pirate area keeps flaunting. So Mabel strikes a bargain with her dad. If she and Frederick can recover the family fortune, the two of them can get married. This provides ample opportunity for the stars to walk around half-dressed. I've never seen a woman like that before. The body is an eight. The brain is a ten. The dialogue is minus twelve. Unfortunately, the Stanley treasure was lost at sea, and the only map to its location is tattooed on the Pirate King's back. So he's the only one who can never see it, I guess? So Mabel honey traps him into taking off his shirt so Frederick can copy the map, and one sexual farce later she makes her escape through kinky blindfold play. Where are you? Mabel, you 
Oh, goosebumps have grown. <laughs> he's being sexually assaulted. But he's the lucky one, as the rest of us have to sit through sin number five, pumpin' and blowin'. This song is performed by Mabel while Frederick wanders around a giant fish tank looking for sunken treasure. It's not so much an insight into her feelings as an excuse for double entendre. <laughs> she said blowin'. That's not the problem with this song. This is the problem with this song. Keep up it. Blowing. Keep up it. Blowing. What is... I can't even... You think we're sick and twisted mortals? Nuh-uh. I have seen the torments of hell, and they're nothing compared to this twisted shit you keep putting into your movies. What combination of drugs and sheer stupidity led to this moment? Who said, hey, you know what this pirate adventure comedy needs? Singing fish that turn into the Rolling Stones logo. Who approved that idea? Hundreds of people must have been involved in this movie. Did none of them say, uh, this is crazy and also kind of nightmarish and maybe we shouldn't put it in here? At all? In fact, the entire buried treasure thing turns out to be a pointless detour. For after Frederick finds Nemo in the Mouth of Madness and recovers the treasure, we learn the pirates are hard on their heels and will launch an assault on the island at any moment. The Major General moves the goalposts on Frederick and says if he can thwart the attack, Mabel's hand is his. Unfortunately, before he can leave to rally the troops, he gets tangled up in another detour as he battles with the Pirate King. <laughs> I think these last two scenes exist because the writers wanted to make sure all the pirate story cliches were covered. The fight is just a walkthrough of the standard swordplay tropes, cutting the candles, swinging on chandeliers, and another random pop culture reference just because. Did I teach you that? Nah, I saw a movie once. You will burn eternally for that line. The fight is another waste of time as the Pirate King and Ruth aren't even there to kill Frederick. They've come to discuss the fine print in his apprenticeship contract. Your date of birth? February 29th, 1856. I leave here. I don't get it. You were apprenticed to us. Until my 21st year. No, no, no. Until your 21st birthday. Leap years only happen every four years. Going by birthdays, you're still only five and a quarter. Right. Let's pause for a moment to elaborate on this development and explain why the movie's handling of it is sin number six. The Leap Year Birthday Paradox is a major turning point in the original Pirates of Penzance, and the reason why the operetta is subtitled The Slave of Duty. Duty! <laughs> hey, what hey, none of that! Anyway, Frederick's extreme adherence to his duty is the play's primary absurdity. Here is a man who switches his allegiance against all his morals, judgment, and inclination in order to honor a slight technicality in a contract that was formed well before he reached an age of discretion, and, I might add, was itself a mistake on the part of his nursemaid. It's a completely ridiculous situation, and like all ridiculous situations in fiction, it's funniest when the characters treat it as being dead serious. No! Pirate movie mishandles the whole concept and sucks all the humor from it. First, by throwing in a bunch of gags that have nothing to do with the issue at hand. You're not gay, are you? No! <clears throat> no. I mean, the way you and that pirate king get around in those rather feminine pleated shirts and all. Then it goes completely to the other extreme and treats the situation like it really is serious. Like Frederick is doing a noble thing by putting his duty before his heart and common sense. And that's the bottom line. To hold you, I have to let you go. And just for good measure, it throws in not one, but two kill the momentum ballads for our leads. How can I live without her? And she's all I'm living for. With Frederick.
Frederick now batting for the other team, Mabel takes it upon herself to lead the forces of law and order, represented by a squad of Keystone cops who do a reasonably good version of one of the few Gilbert and Sullivan songs remaining in the picture. And so the attack on stately Stanley Manor begins, and any semblance of coherence ends. Oh. What? Pizza. The? <laughs> Fuck. No, you know what this movie is? This is the forebearer of the Seltzer and Friedberg movies. It's a bunch of random jokes that have nothing to do with the story and are presented in such a way as to kill any humor potential they might have. Immortality be blessed, that fight sequence is still ten minutes of my life that I'm not getting back. The good guys are eventually cornered and all seems lost. Only one thing can save them now, a Gilbert and Sullivan style deus ex machina. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! This is my dream! I want a happy ending. I want a happy ending! Hey, in the original, the bad guys surrender because someone invokes the name of Queen Victoria. This is hardly any sillier. Frederick gets knighted for putting honor above reason, Mabel pairs up her sisters with the pirates, the pirate king hooks up with Ruth after learning she was behind the wild monkey sex in his cabin, and it's time for the happy final chorus. Sharing, giving, It must be a wedding. Everyone's overdressed and dancing badly. As the last chorus fades out, Mabel returns to the land of the living, only to find Frederick's ring on her finger and his real-world doppelganger standing above her. No, I'm sorry, but sin number eight at the buzzer for trying to pull the was-it-all-a-dream-or-not cliché. That only works if there's enough blurring between realities to make both reality and illusion plausible. It's very clear Mabel dreamed up the whole thing while she was unconscious. Why try to tease us with the idea that she didn't? And why is she suddenly marrying this guy who she's barely met in real life? Just... just roll the verdict before I turn this happy ending into the fifth circle. I don't object to putting a new spin on a classic work. But it helps to understand and honor what made the source material so good to begin with. The pirate movie takes something charming, witty, and satirical and turns it into a weak spoof with juvenile humor. It tries so hard to convince you that it's funny that it never actually gets around to being funny. It may not be the worst movie to appear in this court, but it is certainly one of the most frustrating, and as such receives the following punishments. For replacing a wonderful score with a bad one, we condemn Mike Brady to eat a gourmet meal created by Oscar the Grouch. For the terrible forced comedy in the screenplay, we condemn Trevor Farrand to be trapped on a bus next to Bruce Valanche. And to everyone responsible for pumping and blowing, say hello to your new nightmares. Keep pumping. Blowing. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs> what? For the love of Wormwood, doesn't anything in hell work? Never mind, I got this. Cheap internet piano track, if you please. I send my musicals to Hellfire with love dermaniacal. I've seen the worst of the genre and meet their sins accordingly. From Repo Meme and Phantom down to Prom just into Kelly. If your star is tone deaf, you may be certain I will call you out. Then prove your choreography appalling beyond any doubt. Within my court, there is no quarter to plot holes or such nonsense. Or characters who behave in manners particularly dense. And here's where the chorus would come in, but it's hell. We don't have the budget for a chorus. Offenders and who 
that you get a saving grace, and your lead dancer jetes without falling flat upon her face. Must I send your musical to hell with laughter maniacal? I am the very model of a diva demoniacal.